All right, folks, how we doing? Hope everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Before we kick it off today, we're gonna have uh, the message, which is something that Belinda here has concocted uh, with her shirt, and it is, innovation happens in the white space you create. So with that, let's welcome back Belinda Di Giambattista. I say it right? Yes. To the Hi. show. Uh, oh, you need to clip your mic on. It's oh. behind you. Um, so this is this is my first anniversary show, not anniversary in the sense of uh, it's been one year since we've been doing the show. It's been a little more than that, but uh, this is the first time I've had a guest on exactly a year to the date. So exactly a year ago, last uh, the, the last year, the day after Thanksgiving, we did this sitting right over there. Yes, just switching it up a little bit, and. Uh, it was the first time I had done a remote show because we always did our shows in the studio, but that was the first time the studio was shut down uh, just because of the holiday um, for my show. And I was like, no, we got to do a show still. I want to learn how to do this remote. We got to we got to do this anyways. And it was the first the first remote show and didn't realize at the time that was going to be the way. <laughs> I've done many shows out of uh, we're sitting in Della in my restaurant right now done many shows remotely since then didn't realize that was going to be the thing but it is um and uh it, the last time we we did this uh we worked on kind of identifying what it means to be an entrepreneur um and i think that definition has been refined in the last year um and just a quick recap uh, i don't want to spend too much time because we did this last show so you can go back and look at it if you want more of belinda's story but uh, alum of uh, NYU Business School, right. um, won a, a pretty big competition there, worked on Wall Street and in finance, and then started your own company called Butterbeans, built it up, sold it for like a, a cool mill, <laughs> and and uh, that's still a successful business. And yes. since then, you've gone on to uh, consulting and coaching. Um, one of your more popular uh, handles on social media now is Belinda Biz Coach, right? right. Um, and you know, why don't you catch us up, kind of, to speed from a year ago, where you would you had sold butter beans, you were doing your own coaching. What were some of the transitions that have happened in that time? Yeah, and it really does speak to this concept of creating white space, because. A lot of us wear so many hats, you know, whether it be working, parents, volunteer, whatever, that we have our heads down in the sand a lot of times just doing, 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 and we don't really make time or space to make sure that what we're doing has a goal or it's the right activities that we should be working on. So it's really, really hard to do that, but it's super important to do that. And one of the things that I was, you know, talking about the last time is Figuring out, figuring it out as I go along, because I'd been doing the coaching for a couple of years, and I kept asking myself, you know, what else can I be offering my clients that would really help them even more? And so, around February, March last year, a couple months after I was here, I started to see a trend in my coaching clients in that whenever I would say, let's look at your financial statements and take a look and see how you're doing, none of their numbers made sense. Right. You know, they, they could not go to their accounting system, their QuickBooks, and run a P&L and say, oh, here's my numbers. Yeah. And I happen to be good at accounting. Um, I'm not a CPA and I do not do taxes, but a, a managerial accounting perspective. I'm pretty good at and so I thought to myself I can expand into controller services this is a natural extension to coaching my clients because they look to me for advice but it would be great if we had more of a regular day-to-day -day interaction so that I could be even more involved and so um, I called up a couple of my clients actually one of my clients emailed me a couple weeks after I'd have been having these thoughts and said, I need a new bookkeeper, who do you recommend? And I was like, hmm, how about me? And she said, sure. And then I had another client that I reached out to and said, oh, I decided to start offering this. Would you be interested? And she was like, yes. So I started with a couple of clients that I had already been coaching and it's been a really great, great experience um, so far, but that's kind that's of what great. I've been. And then I have a management consulting client as well. So I've been mm. finding ways to be more done for you 
um, as opposed to explain to you yeah. services. Yeah. So that's really kind of the evolution of where and my business is going. It's kind of like what's happened, you know, worldwide too in the last eight months. Um, yeah. And and you know, part of what you said, I think, really strikes at the core of offering service and entrepreneurship, which is you know we talked at length about that last time, and just like responding to what what people need. I mean, right. sure, you start your business based off of like your skill set and your passion and what you want to do, but really you have to listen a lot. And, Absolutely. And, and let me tell you, that is the hardest part for new entrepreneurs. Yeah. And, you know, in my peer-to-peer -peer group, <laughs> and, I mean, we talk about that a lot. <laughs> we talk about that a yeah. lot. So the white space is like, can you, can you kind of describe that or define it? It's like it's funny on black. It's Black Friday. We're talking about white space. <laughs> exactly. Forget that Black Friday stuff. Exactly. Create your white space yeah. by not, you know, doing. I mean, so on black you were Friday. talking about like it, it's very easy, like as business owners, entrepreneurs, whatever, to like you're really into what you're doing. With the, uh, the email talks a lot about that, where mm -hmm. it's like right. where you're you're operational. It's really hard to see. Um, like growth, expansion, scalability, things like that. Is that is that what the white space is? Yes, the okay. white space is where you kind of put your own, you know, everything you know, you have that baked in, but mm -hmm. just put it aside for a moment and let your imagination work for you. It's kind of like that moment when you're in the shower and those ideas come <laughs> to you. All the good stuff, yes. All the good stuff comes to you. It's because that, it's because you're not trying right. at that moment. I need like a wet board up high I so I can just like. I actually know someone who has that. Yeah. In their shower. It's amazing. Um, because of that reason. Yeah. And um, Danny Eaney has that from Miracy, if anybody is familiar with his work in online courses. But um, it is really just, put, you know, blocking out time, you know, in your day where you go for a walk and you just let things percolate, you know, mm. to use a term from the South. Um, we used to say that all the time. Um, just to allow things to come to you so that, and then do something with it, like take it to the next step. Yeah. Um, and another thing that stood out from your last show, you said it at the very end, and two things really, but we'll just say one right now is finding an accountability partner. Yeah. Because you could, it, which leads to the other thing, which is, uh, what was it, um, imposter syndrome. Because you can easily talk yourself away from like a really awesome idea because your, your internal, whatever your internal monologue or dialogue is, um, it, you know, it, it, could, it could be devastating. And even for like me, I'm like very confident. I'm like, I'll try anything. And it's been exposed <laughs> over the last eight months. That, no, I actually won't. Like, there's, I, 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 I definitely funny. work myself into a corner sometimes. And well, what sometimes you, you, your imposter syndrome is a little bit masked, and you're not yeah. even recognizing that Big that's time. what's happening, and it manifests in different ways. I mean, for some people, they, they, they're like, I can't do this. You know, right. it's Just like really totally obvious, exposed. right? Yeah. yeah. But other times, it's like chasing millions of ideas. Mm -hmm and not being focused. Yeah. So I think that's another manifestation of the imposter syndrome because if you keep starting over a different idea, you never have to finish. Mm. And so no one will ever be able to say you couldn't do it. But that's right. gonna get you right. nowhere fast. Right. So this is another thing that we talk a lot about in my group coaching, which is focus on one thing. And people are really afraid of leaving money on the table because what if somebody else wants my thing? What if somebody else wants my thing? That's great. Focus on one market first, and then once you dial that in, then you can extend your brand. Yeah, and it's like that's like saying, "Oh, but the sale is today," you yeah, know, like exactly. Hint, hint, guys, just exactly. forget about it. Um, yeah, it, it, you know, money on the table is okay. I mean, there's a, there's abundance of most things, and as long as you don't get hit by a car or anything, you, right? You'll get, you know, you'll get your chance still. Um, and it's funny when when you were just you were talking about like the the different ways imposter syndrome manifests. Like I, at first, I was like, no, I don't have that. I don't experience that. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid of anything. And especially doing the mastermind with Lance, yeah. Lance Knob, you know, he's pointed out. You know, be like, well, you know, what's what are your goals? Da da da. da. And I'll be like, yeah, this, but yeah, that's not going to happen. And he's like, why? And I'm like, I, I don't, I don't know. And and I'm like, damn, there it is. <laughs> that's it. And I'm like, shit. And for me, it's more of like. It's it's like 
I like, like I call it reality syndrome, but maybe, you know, reality is what you make it. So I'm like looking at what's happening and I'm like, maybe now is not the time for that. And then people, but if you're around the right people, they're like, why? You know what? It depends because, you know, sometimes you do have competing priorities yeah. that are equally important. And you have to recognize that because if you kid yourself that you can do those two things at the same time, yeah. then you're going to fail and you're going to beat yourself up and you're going to feel like you can't do it. And that's not necessarily the case. The truth of the matter is you're just not putting enough time in mm. that it requires to make it happen. So it, it, it's about prioritization at that point and, and saying, it might not, this thing is not going to happen right now, but I, I'm intentionally putting it aside mm. because I'm really focusing on this other thing. For me, it's more like I'm looking at, I'm like reading the room mm -hmm. and making my own assessment, but that's, you know, that's very subjective, you know, and that's, that's how it shows up for me where sometimes I look at the room and I'm like, I can definitely pull this off right now. And I have no question about trying. And if it fails, I'm like, I don't care. And there's other times I'm looking and I'm like, I don't think this is going to work right now, but it's my own subjective bias right. when maybe it could. And that's, for me, that's how it's been exposed that it shows up, you know, when mm -hmm. I still, you know, have nothing to lose really by doing it. Time, time is always an issue, especially for me, but, um, but it, I won't even give it the time sometimes just because my own subjective mm. bias. And that's, that's how I'm, I'm starting to learn like, well, maybe, maybe there is something there and, right. and I should explore it if, yeah. if I have the time. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the white space because I feel like a lot of uh, a lot of business owners are not able to really talk hard about their numbers yeah. and their P&Ls. Um, you know, you're, especially if you're you're charging a premium and you're making a lot of money or you're just super busy, it can seem like everything's right. fine and dandy. Right. And then, but you always feel like you're catching up. I've been there before, where it's just like, why is this not? working out and you you if you can't do it yourself you really need somebody to open things up and and expose that just like break it all down some of it's like completely unnecessary expenses too right i think look i mean there's going to be unnecessary expenses i mean if you try to like control every one of those then you'll end up right. you know not making money somewhere else because you spent your time trying to save your costs to a degree I think that it all starts with having a vision and a mission and a place where you know you're going. So if you know, you know, generally speaking, what your objective is and, you know, why it is important for you to do it, then you can put kind of a, a milestone in place that you're working toward. And once you start to create the activities that you know that are necessary very intentionally to do those things, then you can get really focused you can focus on your niche, you can do those activities. As they start to get done, the reason you feel like you're constantly catching up is because there's a hundred other things that have already come up for you in the meantime. So that actually is why I have the Celebrate Jar. Go, go. Let's because it is our culture to not stop and celebrate those small wins. Yeah. So even those little activities that you've done you know, in the last month that may feel like, you know, checked off a box, they're actually huge contributing factors to meeting your ultimate objective, you know, six months from now, nine mm -hmm. months from now. And so the idea is that whenever you do accomplish something or something happens that's great, you write it on a piece of paper like this and you put it in your jar. And then when you're feeling like you just described, gosh, I'm like treading water. Why can't I ever get ahead? Mm. You take this jar out and you start reading everything that you wrote down and you start to give yourself credit and acknowledgement that, wow, I actually have made progress. And if you, if you don't do that, if you don't take that time, and again, that is a white space area to just stop and take the time to yeah. acknowledge and celebrate the activities that you've done that are gonna get you to where you're going, um, then you are constantly going to feel like you're never enough. So you're forcing me now to go back to my original quote. I was going to do a different qu message of the week. And she was just like, I got this shirt. And I was like, oh, well, you just hijacked the quote. But <laughs> that goes, what I was going to, I was going to quote Jim Rohn. And gratitude is the beginning of the receiving process. And that's like a prime example how when you're feeling beat up, especially as business owners, you know, there's not a lot of time to come up for air. Right. So you really need to focus on, on that. And when you take that moment to be great, like you see this, you're like, okay, 
Uh, yes. I, there's a lot of things. And I, I liken it to fitness. It's like if you want to be fit in six months, you don't go out one day and crush it. And then you're like, I'm fit now. You right. have to chip away a little bit every day. Exactly. And at six months, you weigh yourself again. Or you try that pair of pants on or that bathing suit or whatever. And you're like, oh, either you did it or you didn't. Mm -hmm. Either, you know, the, uh, the action, you know, fit the goal or it didn't and you need to adjust. Um, so this is a great way to kind of assess where you're at. Right. Remind yourself that you're not, you know, you don't suck as bad maybe as you thought you did to, to have that fuel. Because if you're in that, um, if you're in that negative mindset where you're always yeah. just like, I can't catch up, I can't, I can't, I can't. Right. You won't. The yes. chances you won't are greater. Right, because you are, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm, right. And that's why it's super important to actually intentionally choose the activities that you're doing that are in service to that objective, to that mission. And then when you do them, even though, you know, you're not at the summit, you yeah. have made progress. So you're, you're a, a fan of the mission statement and the business plan. I think the business plan writes itself. I think, meaning? Meaning that whenever, so I do think you should write your mission because I think it's, it's your North Star, hmm. okay? So for example, my mission is all about helping more small businesses succeed and bring abundance to their owners and all of their employees. Therefore, the society around us and our communities right. are going to be better off that's my mission okay um what is my do I, how do i write my business plan well there's the different components right the operations and the marketing and the target market and all of those things as i go out and talk to clients or prospective clients and i ask them questions about what their pain points are and about what their needs are and i take notes about the things that they say everything i write down from the notes in those interviews that's part of the business right. plan it's it's a grow it's organic exactly it's yeah. a living you know organism so i don't necessarily think i think if you some people want to write a business plan just for the sake of it because it helps them orient themselves which is fine but a lot of people don't want to just sit down and write a business plan and they don't have to um <laughs> but i do think that every action that you're doing is the is the business plan writing itself yeah. so if you had your voice memo on your phone mm -hmm. recording those interviews and then you you know got a transcription service and just got it in, onto the paper you have your customer section just written for yeah. you yeah yeah um I, I mean in terms of you talked about focus um do you think having those written plans down to help people focus because that like i've never done it before until doing this mastermind, like literally never wrote anything down. Yeah. Um, so it manifests differently for different people. Yeah. And um, so for example, I had a client, you know, she was trying to figure out what her direction was and I had her write a bunch of notes about where do you see yourself in a few years from now? And then she put it on a shelf and then a couple years later, I got it back out and I read it to her and she'd done every single thing she wrote, but she had not revisited that paper since that day. So I do think that writing it down, I do think physically writing with the, a pen and paper instead right. of typing is even the best. Absolutely. Um, because it does help your brain and those synapses connect mm -hmm. on what it is you're actually doing and it will intuitively help you do things that are in service to those goals. Um, for certain people, they need to actually see it every day. Mm. So they're gonna write it down and they're gonna They've post got, like, it. The boards. Yeah, exactly, yeah. and they're gonna be reminded of it. So I think it just I think it I think it definitely helps, but it it comes out in different ways for different people. How what was her response when you read? She was really surprised. Yeah. So is she not kept up, and, and was she kind of like feeling like negative and, and a little beat down? She always is like that. Like <laughs> why am I why is why is it so much easier for everybody else? I'm like. She says, uh, what, it's what, not. <laughs> she's like, is there somewhere I could go and like watch other people work so I can see how they do it better than me? I said, if you did that, you would leave thinking we're not doing so bad. Right. Right. Yeah. Some people just have a good game face. Yeah. Or, or exactly. Or disposition. I mean, you know, res it, restaurant owners are notorious for that because you just have to, you know, nobody wants to come in and uh, be greeted with, with, you know sour attitude that's you know that's a quick way to lose a customer right you know um and then in terms of the you know your clients um over the last eight months how how has that changed due to due to uh the shutdown is it more digital now or are you still dealing with 
uh, people with brick and mortar stores? How have some of those things changed for you over the last eight months? So, I mean, my clients, one of them was already e-commerce. She did have a brick and mortar store briefly, even mm -hmm. before COVID started, but I'm not sure she's made a decision yet about whether or not she's going to continue that, but the, a the actual e-commerce was always the bread and butter, mm -hmm. and so that has actually done quite well um, yeah. in this particular period. Um, in terms of, we'll see how the unemployment, you know, continues to play out and how that starts to impact certain businesses. The other client, it's in education, so it's been a back and forth kind of situation. <laughs> But for very young kids, so that's helpful because that's a better, you know, more stabilized and more support, I think, from the government officials to keep those kids engaged versus, you know, school age kids that they are obviously feeling are quite capable to do it from home. Yeah. Um, which I'm not sure I always agree with all of that, but. Um, case by case. Case by case. And so it's been, it's been very, very difficult. I think the thing that's been big, it's, it's these massive interruptions and then all of a sudden you have, well, here's a PPP loan and then there's a whole gamut that comes along with applying for this loan and figuring out how to apply for the forgiveness and what does that mean? And now understanding the tax implications of that forgiveness and you know the idle loan. So I think the work um, became more complicated because there were more balls to juggle. Mm. Um, trying to figure out how to to service everybody so that actually I feel like put a bigger um, it was a bigger workload than it would have been normally well I think most people could say like they're working more yeah now even people that are that you know fully remote they're like my god it's so much more work now than it was yeah and then add kids office. on home at home on top of that yeah um, did you did you uh, you know go through some PPP uh, applications with some yes. with some of your clients. What was that experience like? I mean, I did it myself. Right. It honestly. <laughs> I know from my, it my depended on the bank. Yeah. And it was really wild to see mm. the differences between the banks that were ready and the banks that weren't. Yeah. Um, fortunately, our bank became ready. You know, within about seven to ten days of the first banks getting their applications out there. And now that we've turned in the forgiveness application, it feels like a black hole. Like, okay, so how's now that? What? Yeah, how's that process work? Because I, I mean, I applied and we didn't get it, and I just left it alone and didn't didn't you reapply. Know what? Yeah. So, oh, you mean the, in the first place? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, I'm, so I, we didn't get one, so I don't have to apply. Like, right. how does it? How does the whole thing? You play have out? to provide all of the documentation for your payroll. And then you have to provide the documentation for the rent you paid and provide documentation for all of your utilities that you paid mm -hmm. during that period. So it was a lot of downloading documents yeah. and statements from websites and uploading them into, so there's two forms. If you took less than I think 500,000 or a million dollars, then there's an easy form, which was good because that was easier than the full yeah. form, um, which fortunately was the one we filled out. And so then it, so it was pretty straightforward but we click submit, and it's just like wait and see, you know? But here's the kicker, for every dollar you get forgiven, you cannot take it as an expense on your tax return. Gotcha. So if you had, say you'd gotten a $25,000 PPP loan, and you'd gotten, and you'd paid, and you did $25,000 for the payroll, and you paid for the payroll, and you got the forgiveness, that's $25,000 you cannot take as an expense. Mm -hmm. Right, so you have to pay taxes on it still. You have to pay still. taxes on it still. As income. Yeah. Um, and have you heard back in terms of the forgiveness? Not yet. From anything. So you might not get, what, yeah, that, like I talked to somebody working in a bank that was receiving yeah. and approving the loans. Yeah. And I, this was, you know, this was over this summer, I don't remember what month, and I just said, how's it going? And she was like, nobody knows what they're doing. I know. Like from the lender side. I no, like, I'm sure from the lender side. I think that that's why they wouldn't approve loans that were outside of their clients. Um, but the interest rate is 1%. So I think that worst case... It's a loan. It's a loan. I don't think most people were planning on taking a loan. <laughs> no, they weren't. I mean, that's one of the only reasons I'm glad we didn't get it, because I did not want a loan, and we, we managed without it. Yeah. Um, but uh, so no, nobody's really heard back in terms of mm -hmm. forgiveness. The application is due December 31st. I'm not sure when they're gonna start yeah. offering forgiveness. Oof, sketchy. I know, sketchy. it is. So tell us what, what we have here. So yeah, so I 
decided this year to create um, some tools for people to help them get through their day. And so these stickers are, I'm relieved, because there's some days when you're like, like so ready to get, you're like trying to get something done and you just can't, and it's causing you so much stress and then it finally gets done. So, and then you feel relief. Yeah. One is I am celebrating, you know, to go along with these things that you, these little wins along the way. One is I am stuck because we often get stuck and we're, and we're just like banging our head against the wall, but just to acknowledge it and to, and to know you're not alone, that other people feel stuck too. And one is ask me about my business. So I thought these would be fun um, for people. And then I, I created this notepad for your desk. Mm -hmm. And at the top it says, I'm showing up today to do. And again, it comes back to focus and just really making your day about one thing. And as long as you get that one thing done, whatever happens the rest of the day is gravy. And then, and these actions support this goal. So you're gonna write your checklist for that day, making sure that you're really in service to whatever it is that mm -hmm. makes a huge difference towards your milestone. And then it, the, the font's a little small here, but there's a, a link to the resources page of my website where there's a bunch of free templates for people to use. What um, is your website? Tell my me. website we'll do it is, again at the end, but. Yes, you can go to belindadi.com. Okay. And there is a resources page on there, and there's a bunch of free templates for people to use on their to, to, to write their business plan if you, in a nutshell. So what about those days where you, you have your goal, you write it down, supporting actions, and then just like life gets in the way, and at the end of the day, you look and you're like, I didn't get there, I didn't get it done. What's, what's the internal message system then? That you want to adopt? Yeah. There's always tomorrow. Um, beating yourself up just really does not do any good. And it also would help you to ask yourself, was what I wrote down to get done today too big? Mm -hmm. um, because if it is, then you need to make it smaller. So if you're writing a book and you write, oh, today I'm gonna write a chapter and you write 10 pages, but you don't write a whole chapter, then maybe what you set out to do maybe for the, the day too much was too much, for a day. exactly. Yeah. So make sure that you are doing things in bite-sized pieces. I love the book, Atomic Habits. I um, don't know that one. Oh my God, it's amazing. I listened to the audio version and it's by James Clear. And you know, Atomic Habits are these teeny tiny little habits that you can, uh, that you can create for yourself um, over time. And then when you put them all together, it makes a huge difference. I mean, that seems like the reoccurring thing today, like what you're talking about yeah. is like yeah. the the, uh, the small victories are really what win the war, yes. not... I say my overnight success with Butterbeans took nine years. Yeah, I've, I've heard that a lot. Yeah, it yeah. became an overnight uh, sensation in, in like 15 years. Exactly. I hear a lot of guys uh, say that it's... it's uh, you know the work all along the way that people don't see they see like exactly they, they see the big win or and 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 you have to be willing to put in the time yeah. and put in the commitment and make the investment if you really want to get out of it what you want to get out of it um and then some of the other things we've just spoken about uh in passing um in terms of uh future future projects you're you've gotten interested in uh software development yeah and, um, you know, the, one of the things we're always working towards, we talked a lot about like efficiency today and the yeah. getting into the white space so you can be more efficient, but then like the idea of scalability too, right. to where you're just, you know, you don't, even, even though you're, you're, you know, you're going to have bad days, you're going to have days where like businesses, you know, maybe you're not performing the way or bad years, mm -hmm. like, you know, <laughs> like this one. But if you have, uh, we talked about this last time too, having eggs in other baskets right. where you're just, you're bringing in, I don't want to use the word passive income necessarily, right. but, but where something else is coming in. So yeah. the, the fight over here is diminished because of the win over here. Totally. I think having a portfolio approach is a really good idea. I, I don't think starting two new projects at the exact same time is a good idea. Um, but I do think that getting one to the point where you can now take some of that brain power and channel it to another project is a good idea. Yeah. And if you do, you know, I mean, a lot of people are a little skeptical about partnering, but if you find the right partner um, and they have brain power to also contribute, mm -hmm. then that can be really powerful. I, I, I mean, I, I prefer that as opposed to when you're the, the last 
buck, yep. you know, on everything. It gets, it's a lot of pressure. It this, is. A, guys, uh, a couple guys came in here uh, like a month or so ago, and they're interested in opening their own restaurant. And they, they've been in hospitality forever, run major places, so they yeah. know they've just never taken that last step to ownership. Um, and, and I think they're interested in partners. And one of the guys just looked at me, his two brothers <laughs> from Sicily, and one of them just looked at me and said, what's the one thing you have to have like you as a business owner if you were going to open a new business what's like number one and i was like there has to be the the person there has to be the point person it right. has to be a partner it has to be somebody that has skin in the game i'm not interested in just opening a business where there's nobody there as as the point of reference like yeah. there has to be that face in that person and i was like and it can't be me <laughs> And, and he was appreciative of that because yeah. he, I think he wants to own a restaurant, but not be there every day. Mm. And I'm like, well, then you need to have the person, exactly. you know, because otherwise you, you're, you're not planning for long-term success. And he was talking about, um, you know, the, the potential to build it, to sell it. Mm -hmm. And I said, cool, if you want to do that, run it like you're going to pass it down to your children. Right. And he's like, what do you mean? I was like, you have to trick yourself because if you were running a business and building a business to sell it, you're going to you're going to be focused on the number side of things yeah. and not the, the customer side right. of things. And, and you want to pass off this like polished gym, yeah. not like, I mean, that's tricky, right? When you're looking at numbers, you're like, oh, well, you're doing this good on your reports, but like the place is in shambles, your reviews are awful. Like <laughs> what? Well, you won't be able to sell that. <laughs> right, exactly. Where if you build it, like you were going to, it, like it was a family member yeah. and like your children were, and the guy didn't even have kids. So it was kind of hard for him to grasp, but I think he, he understood it um you know just you have to trick yourself and, yeah. and make it like the best possible business yeah and then you know everybody's gonna look at it different right like i mean when you I, sold a business right so you, and the guy who bought my business told me that he started with a list of 40 businesses and then he whittled it down to 10 and then three and one of the reasons that our business was just always in the mix is because everything was so tight yeah the operations like he could run reports he could see mm -hmm. how there were job descriptions everything was in place and that was super attractive to him and staff right i mean he oh, had yeah. it was a full staff yep most people stayed on board and right? everybody were trained yep. yeah yeah exactly so when you're treating your internal mechanisms yes. the right way it's much more attractive than like here's a piece of paper that says what we made I mean, it's just like a hot and mess. There were, and, the, and, he, and, there were, and there were businesses that he looked at that yeah. represented that and maybe yeah. and probably made more money than ours, and he just couldn't do it. Right. Well, it depends. Uh, it, you, he I just think, didn't even know what he was getting into because everything was such a mess. Right. And, and he probably wanted something more long term. Absolutely. Where, I mean, something he could retire with. Right. And, and when you get into some of those situations, it's way more work. Yeah. You know, you might as well just start your own business mm -hmm. and build it from the ground up because it's, it can often oh, be harder. True to go in <laughs> I know because yeah. I've done it and <laughs> fix wow. something I have not done that fix something that's broken and yeah. like get it get it back up uh, then than just starting from scratch and at least you know at least yeah. it's your problems and, right. you know your mistakes um, so what's what's the situation with the software do you want to talk about that a little bit well, you don't have to go into detail but just the ideology behind it I yeah, think is really think fascinating to the me the ideology is you know, if you see a gap in the market where there is going to, you know, either there could be potential clients or, um, or customers, or you see trends changing, particularly due to COVID, you know, this is something that has changed a lot of trends, a lot of habits, yeah. habits change. And you see that there's a gap in the market in terms of, um, something that could be offered you know maybe it's a service and then you realize that service would be a lot easier if there were a software solution to to solve it so i'll give you an example of something that where there is not a gap where there's a solution but before quickbooks you know we maybe used excel to do our accounting mm. or or we used some clunky you know peach tree type of program um, or maybe people did it uh, even uh, in a more manual way. Right, you, you had to make up your own formulas. And, exactly, yeah, yeah, so I, because I there was either, there was really maybe nothing super simple to use, mm -hmm. like QuickBooks is pretty easy, but there was like an overkill solution, which for small businesses maybe was too much, yeah. um, or there was, you know, an Excel spreadsheet. Get in there and do it Right, yourself. and nothing in between. Yeah. So they saw a gap in the market, 
and they realized that if they created something simple to use that was affordably priced for a small business to be able to afford it, then they could capture a lot of market share. So that's an example. And they did of, a good job with that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Um, and they've got competitors now too, right? Like there's fresh books and all mm -hmm. these other types of bookkeeping systems out there now going for that particular market. So I would say this is where the white space comes in, right? Like as you're walking down the street, as you're walking your dog, as you're eating at, you know, your takeout, getting your takeout from restaurants these days, as you're going to the grocery store, whatever it is, getting gas, just look around you if you're interested in creating something because the idea is you know, if you did create a piece of software that people were able to use and it was a SaaS sort of solution, then that is something that you can build, capitalize the cost, but once you get the subscribers, then it's recurring revenue. Right. Um, just like a restaurant has a point of sale system, right? That's right. a recurring revenue for that company that is leasing you that point of sale system, so to speak. There's a monthly bill, and that's what's interesting to me about software. If I could find something that was um, able to be sold to a market that was large enough, maybe restaurant owners, right? Mm -hmm. um, that they would wanna pay for this, just like Grubhub has done, just like Uber Eats has done. So they've taken advantage of these trends, these changes in the marketplace. Don't I, be like them. <laughs> I, 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 I bought a pair of Levi's jeans online and I was offered same day delivery. And I was like, oh, interesting, Grubhub brought it. Like, it's really fascinating how yes. they are really tapping into... And DoorDash as well. Maybe it was DoorDash yeah. that actually DoorDash delivered it. DoorDash has done a really, a really solid job of keeping those keeping the, the drivers employed. Right. Which, I, which I'm uh, at so least... So now that you mention it, I think it was DoorDash yeah. that actually delivered the jeans. But it was, you know, not at all who I expected yeah. to be delivering the jeans. And so I, I think that they were, again, they were looking at the white space. Mm -hmm. You know, they already, they, they had their drivers, right? Everything was in motion. Everything yeah. was in motion. And now they're like, well, gosh, these drivers are only working 20 hours a week. Mm -hmm. They're not making enough money. What can we do? It's, it's, it's when you know the question to ask, what can we do to help these drivers get more hours a week? And then you get out the whiteboard that has nothing on it. And you start to think, all right, what's the environment? Right. And you start to lay out the layers. That's when you are able to see the possibilities that you're not having seen before. And it's difficult to do that if your head is stuck in daily oh, operations. You can't see yeah. it if your head is you're, stuck in daily operations. Because that, that can get muddy. But if you're- It if is you're, muddy. <laughs> if you're literally, you know, mapping out your environment and you're thinking, oh, my, my sister needed jeans the other day and nobody, and she had to like pay 50 bucks for an Uber to bring them because there was no <laughs> delivery from that store. Maybe we could deliver those jeans. It's like giving yourself the space yeah. to like come up with that idea when you're DoorDash. It's like the mental shower. It's the same thing. It's the mental the shower. The mental shower. Yeah. That's great. Um, another thing you said, and this, I, I didn't even, I wasn't even aware of it a year ago. Um, a, a gentleman came on the show, I think it was in January or maybe the end of December, and he brought it up. And it was he was a very interesting figure because he was a musician mm -hmm. and created this school for children and yeah. this whole uh, organization. But he, he kept saying social entrepreneurship, yeah. and I was just like, "What does that mean?" And you yeah. really hit on it earlier, where you were talking about the idea of and, and you even a, min, a moment ago talking about uh, the employees at Butterbeans and and DoorDash as well. Like the idea that you're not just doing something for yourself, it is for the community around right. you. It's like, this is something that will be beneficial to the employees. It'll be beneficial to the, maybe the physical space that we live in or yeah, where the business the resides. Or if it's a, a digital based thing, it's going to be good for whatever digital community that is. I'm, how long has that been a, a, like a vibe for you because it's, I've always felt that way, but I couldn't put that those words together. And when he, when Josh said it, uh, it was Josh Margolis when he said it on the show. I was kind of like, "Whoa, yeah, that's really awesome." I mean, honestly, for a couple of decades, even oh, before oh, I started right. Butterbeans, and here's why. I'm always late. Here's why, <laughs> because I, when I worked in corporate America, it was all about corporate governance at that time. Yeah. So it was about making sure that the board of directors had independence, and was offering actual governance and not just a yes man for the CEO to do whatever he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So that was huge 
when I, and they, they started to have corporate, and I worked for a ratings agency, that, so there were corporate governance ratings, and there were all kinds of people watching to see if these corporations were doing what's best for you know, the world mm -hmm. and not just their pockets, right? And so, and then I went to NYU, and in the, in, and in the business plan competition, there's, there's three tracks. Okay, I did the traditional track, but another one was a social entrepreneurship track. Well, I guess we did talk about this so a little bit. Yeah. It wasn't a new term for me because now it has, tr the, the, the trend from that, because that was back in 2009, um, 11 years later, you know, you almost can't have a business that doesn't have a social component for people to look at seriously. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming a big deal in the investment community as well, if you've ever heard of ESG policies, where it's in environmental, um, governance and social policies to where you know you can't we're not going to invest in somebody who's making you know missiles that are gonna yeah. you know bomb somebody <laughs> so so that is a policy that you know billions of dollars that are at work trillions of dollars that are at work will specifically not invest in certain companies if they do not meet these social policies so it's from small to large yeah. Um, but I, 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 I'm a big fan of Thomas Friedman, and he talks about it a lot, just the community. And I, and I really believe that when we see these communities falling apart, you know, from here or there, it makes me so sad. But I do know if these people had jobs, if they had something that they felt good about themselves yeah. for, if they had a purpose, if they were able to provide for their families, we would have less of that problem. So I believe that small businesses, being 99.9% .9 of the businesses in this country, yeah have a role to play in making sure that we are profitable, making money enough to pay for our employees to be able to have jobs and have benefits and, and support their families and therefore the communities. And um, I, I mean, just from my experience working in communities like that, where the businesses are mainly small and you yeah. know, take a community like Windsor Terrace where there's, no, there's not many you know, corporations, no. Uh, there's definitely a deeper sense of connection right. to what's happening than if, if this was like a strip of, you know, McDonald's and you yeah. know Starbucks and everything, where where people are just coming in and punching. Totally, I lived in a high-rise building in Manhattan and wanted desperately to know the people on my floor, but they had no interest in knowing me. Like yeah. it, it was, it was not the same. You know, me coming from North Carolina or. You know, even, you know, in San Francisco, people were more friendly mm -hmm. in a high rise building than, than here. It was it was no getting to know your neighbors. And what do you what do you accredit that to? It was a very corporate group of people. You know, these people worked everybody for large corporations. Sometimes they were transient, sometimes half time in New York, half time mm -hmm. in L.A. or you know, they had their friends already. They didn't and, need more. <laughs> and if you're splitting time, it's just very difficult. Why, why would you invest? Yeah. And in getting to know yeah. the people around you. Yeah, very different from here. So, what is you know what what can small business owners do right now? I mean, we talked a little bit about just responding to you know paying attention uh, to the market, to what's happening, getting your head out of it's. It's been hard. I mean, for a lot of yeah. us, myself included. Um, you know, I had I had a lot more time for white space the previous three years, yeah. and now I'm I'm a lot more manual. <laughs> you know, um, right? And but I, I know it's important, but not, not everybody. You know, I I'm I'm surrounded by some great people, yourself included, that, that are constantly, you know, pulling on my my attention to like get out of the operations and and think bigger. Um, you know, a lot of people have been forced into that situation and, and other challenges this year. What what are some resources now? What are some some things that they can do to get them closer to the white space and out of out of the you know the funk? Yeah, the I mean, funk. I would say first and foremost, just you know, give yourself a break and be super realistic with this time. Yeah. Um, you know, not everybody is in the same situation, mm -hmm. and I mean. I know for me, I feel like I have less time even with my kids home all the time from school. That has been a major impact on me feeling like, you know what, maybe my growth plan needs to be put off six months mm -hmm. so that I can just make sure that I don't go crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, and make sure that my kids have the attention that they need and get the education that they need in this time when they're not actually with a teacher. Um, so just give yourself a break first and foremost and make sure that what you're expecting of yourself is realistic. And if you do have the opportunity and are fortunate enough to be able to say, you know what, right now what I'm doing is enough and I do need to make sure my family's okay, 
then if that's what you need to do, then take the few months that you need to do that. Everything's yeah. gonna still be here. But if you do have the capacity and you are ready to incorporate some white space, I would go back to what you were saying before, the accountability partner, because mm -hmm. you really need to find a way to keep yourself focused. Um, you know, everybody has a million ideas, which is great, but you really need to just pick one and focus on it. And that's with, you know, work and everything else that you're doing is en brings enough distraction to your life to where you just need to focus on one new thing at a time. And if you have an accountability partner, um, then you are able to stay true to that. And, you know, that's why I, I, I love peer to peer so much. Um, which is my group coaching program because you know people that are that come every single week absolutely you know we are the accountability team yeah and as people have started to set quarterly goals and say well this is what where I want to be in three months and really focus on all right here's what I'm doing this week we say this every week what are we what are you gonna do between now and next week that's gonna be working toward that. Yeah. And they all know what they're working on, they're all clear about it. Sometimes they post it on the chat that we have on our mm -hmm. private group if they um, aren't able to come for whatever reason, but they're super engaged with each other, they're helping each other at this point, which is super cool to see. Um, and they are saying, I feel really good about where I am right now, which is a very different story from, I don't know what I'm doing or where I'm going or how I'm gonna get there. So yeah. it, it, when you have somebody else to help you and, that, and listen to you and play back for you what you're saying yourself, you know, it can, yeah. really, it can really help well, you. Well, I was saying that earlier, you know, like I'm, I've had the same experience and, and Lance just invited me into this thing. He's like, just try it out and see what you think. Because prior, I'd never done anything. I was always just like in the woods alone, yeah, chopping down the exactly. trees, um, which I don't mind. I, I, you know, but that only... It, I came to a point where I realized like that only gets you so far. Like you yeah. can get pretty far, but That's if, right. if you have bigger aspirations, then, then you really have to work in, in a team format. That's right. Um, because you can't do it alone. That's right. Um, and, and we were experiencing the same thing and we've got, you know, a little crew now and it's re it was really fascinating to me how like pumped it got me. Cause I'm a yes. pretty like inspired person. And I was like, wow, there's more, <laughs> you know, the well's deeper. And we're doing the same thing where there's there's goals and we even plug it in a spreadsheet and before the next meeting, yeah. we're all supposed to go back and like recap and we can see everybody else's. Yep. So it's like, it's that accountability on the front line. And if you don't do it, it's like, well, why not? And you know, hopefully it's, you were like super busy with like your yeah. actual, cause for most people it's, it's, um, it's it's a growth oriented uh, mastermind where like right. we have income we have either our own business or yes. whatever this is about like Getting the, to next the next step level. yeah leveling up and doing something additional um, so right. sometimes hopefully it's like we were just slammed and I just didn't have time to put into right. this or or whatever else but it, it's that accountability where you're like I know I'm like shit. I got I got it's coming up on Tuesday like I got to finalize right. these things I got to get these in and it's just that little extra bit of pressure exactly. but I, I feel like it's the a good kind of pressure I, it's not like you know your boss is over you yeah because you know you're working on your business yeah. not in your it's, business it's for you right, right. the yeah. the email thing again but mm -hmm. um but it's it's it, you know it's supportive you know, oh, you know, yeah. there's like no real repercussion That's right. at the end of it. It's like, this is for you. It's not for him. He's not, it's, it's not his money. Exactly. You know, this is your money. So you, you've got that, that pressure under you. And, and uh, I, I've, I found the, the process really fascinating. So is that also um, under Belinda, D, is it, was it D-I-G-I.com? Yeah, D-I.com. D-I.com. Yep. Um, so there you offer private one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. consultation and then you've got uh group coaching sessions is right. that is that encompassed by the peer-to-peer -peer or is there yes. more no peer-to-peer -peer is the group coaching and actually right now for the holidays and maybe we'll keep it if it becomes popular you can give the gift of group coaching to your favorite oh, entrepreneur nice. in your life so for a, there's a three month subscription special uh -huh. for ninety nine dollars. So if you go to my website, then there's a top bar you can click on it and it'll take you. Or there's a shop button now, which I'm super excited nice. about. Um, and so you can give the gift of peer to peer if you have if you know an entrepreneur, if you've got somebody in your family or your friends that keep bugging you to death and you feel like they're a business therapist and you're tired of it, you can send them to us. 
Um, so that's really that. Is, that. is that the next title, business therapist? Yes. I, I like that. It, I hear it all the time. This is like business therapy for me. It um, really is. It really is. And so definitely check that out for group coaching. On the private client side, it's everything from you know one-on-one -on -one business coaching, leadership coaching, all the way up to the controller services mm -hmm. and the management consulting services. Um, and uh, I forgot what I was going to ask. Take the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess if anybody has any questions that they would like answered, they can put them in your chat. They can. Um, you can drop them in the comments here on Facebook. Comments. And Belinda is tagged in this and we'll be glad to get back. Yeah, and I can answer any questions anybody has um, for for anything. There were a couple comments, but it was, it was on Patty's... Uh, profile and it was Ada. She said, hi, it's Ada. Uh, hi, Ada. <laughs> That's all we got so far. And my man, Dom Jackson said, woo. Uh, we've got a, a Ric Flair gift thing going back and forth. Um, are there <laughs> other ways, we, we still have a little time, are there other ways people can um, can get in contact with you besides the website? What, tell yeah. everybody your social media. So yeah, so I actually and, write a weekly column and you can also find that on my website. Um, it's it, But I, it's published on an, a website called Sensei, C-E-N-T. SAI. It's a financial literacy gotcha. platform mm -hmm. and my 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 column is called peer to peer and it's all small business related topics. So there's like, you know, 6 months worth of stuff on there every week for the past 6 months. So you'll find lots of stuff there. Also, um, I'm on Instagram, Belinda Biz Coach, and Pinterest, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, what, Twitter whatever your flavor is, you can find me. Um, Define. And I have an email list too. If you want to go to my website, and that's on the website. That's what I was alluding okay. to. Is there is there a way email to? But it's it's right on the right next to the shop button. Yes. <laughs> um, define small business. Ha <laughs> <laughs> So small business. It's easier to define as defined entrepreneur. by the SBA is five hundred oh, employees cool. or less, which is kind of interesting. So what? You know, yeah. So my has nothing to do with revenue. No. So my. My definition of small business is, you know, you kind of break it up into a couple of different ways. You have your solopreneur, mm -hmm. okay, um, and then you have an employee, you, and then you may have a situation where you have somebody who has a couple of employees and a lot of contractors. Mm -hmm. So there's that situation. And then there's a small business that I would say you know, up to a hundred employees, five, six million dollars in revenue between one million and five or six million. That is a category of small business where you're too big to be small, too small to be big. Right. Because you don't make enough money to hire another one of you mm -hmm. um, to be able to give enough off your plate right. to be able to like focus on the white space all the time. Um, but you are so close. You know, so that's a really tricky place. And I would say, actually I have a friend, Sandy Webster, who just is about to launch a course, which I highly recommend, on how to build a business advisory board. So if you are in that space, I would say one million to six million, that would be huge for you. Because you wanna be able to get other people that have huge amounts of in, um, experience helping you find ways to get you to that $10 million level where you can hire another one mm -hmm. of you, a, a co-CEO or a COO, or somebody who really can take a lot off of your plate. But that is a much bigger you know, proposition yeah. whenever you get to that point. So I think small business is you know, $100,000 on the small, like a startup, like you're just starting up is like, trying to get to that first 50,000, you're like in launch phase. Yeah. You're just by yourself figuring it out. What am I doing? What do I make? Who cares? And then when you get to the 100,000, you're like, okay, I figured out a few people who will buy my thing. Then to get to the 250 mark, that's where you're just like, all right, you know, how can I start to scale? How can yeah. I start to get, you know, refined process to 1 million. Yeah. So those are the different phases, I would say. Um, and the financial advisory board, they're basically there, like you said, people with a lot of experience. Yeah, just it's not like, just financial, it's business advisory. Our business advisory. Yeah, so they said, should be able yeah. to help you with every aspect of your business. And, and those, are, are, those are paid positions? It could go either way. Yeah. 
it doesn't have to be paid. Like for example, I'm on an advisory board for a company right now and she offered us like a quarter of a percent of a share of right. stock. I didn't know if they yeah. yeah. So that's one way to provide, you know, compensation if you will. Mm. Some ba some boards are completely unpaid. Yeah. Um, and, and are these, especially at that level, are they a mix of public and private? Only public companies, only no, private companies? No, you can companies? have all, all private. Yeah. All private. And, and, you know, that's why we call it an advisory board at that level and not a board of directors. Right. You know, if you have a board of directors, that's like getting into fiduciary responsibility mm. and all this and that. This is not that. This yeah. is just, you know, people who are wanting to give back, who want you to succeed, who are willing to show up to your meeting once a quarter and give you feedback throughout and help you make good decisions. I need to find people like that. Yes, they exist. You should take Sandy's course. <laughs> that sounds and all great. Your, and all your spare time. I know, right. We'll get there. I, I mean, as soon as, you know, I, I think in the near future, my places will get to a point where oh yeah, it, it gets back to some whatever, you know, things were never normal before, <laughs> but uh, that operational level where I'm, I'm not working yeah. every day. Well, like you, you said, know. you need that person. Yeah. I mean, I have them. I just can't afford them right now because that's right. Things have, you know, things have tanked, but we, we stayed, we stayed here. We're still here. Yeah. We stayed the course. I know. That's what I say. Give yourself a break. You know, whenever it's a Re moment. Oh, I want the break. I just did what I had to do. I, that's you know. what I, I'm saying. Give yourself a break in the sense the that... The 2020 break? No, the, in the sense... Yes, the 2020 yeah, break. No, for real. Yeah. I, did, I mean, it's a, big, it's a big deal because I had plans and goals and we talked about it. I've yeah. talked about it with many people and it all just had to get paused. Exactly. And I had to not beat myself up. Right, that's what like, I meant. Listen, this, I know, I got it. It's like, this is... If, if you care about what you have on your plate right now, you just focus on that. And it was good for me because I'm kind of all over the place and, and always trying so many things. And and I it was the first time in my life where I realized like the time limit was real. Yeah. You know, it was like there's only so many things I can dedicate myself yeah. to in a day because people are always asking me to do other stuff. And I had to focus on like what I, I mean, I didn't pick one. I picked four things that are like super important to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like. This is kind of where I have to draw the line right now yeah. because of the requirements right. and the commitments to the businesses um, just having to, to step in. And I know they'll be better off at the yeah. end. And once once we get to the point where we can have staff back, I'll be more efficient right. at, at getting, you totally. know, finding the white space. I'm kind of fascinated by this idea. It's, it's like, it's very ethereal. It's mm -hmm. very, um, was, there was a word I wanted to, uh, I'm just kind of spacing today. It's the turkey. <laughs> it's a tryptophan. I don't know about you, but I ate I ate a ridiculous amount of food yesterday. Yes. Um, it'll come to me after the show. But that same <laughs> idea where um, it's it's just more introspective. Yeah. You know, um, and and your your body's still doing like the work. You know, that's always there, but you're able to kind of separate. Yeah. And get into. And a you can do this headspace. with your team too. You know, mm -hmm. whenever there's an opportunity, sometimes it's good okay. to do it with your team outside of your normal space. Yeah. Well, it's just like uh, having it, like board retreats and stuff like that. Yeah, it's really hard. Exactly. There, there's a, a classic, uh, uh, like martial arts saying, "You don't learn war in war." You know, it's it's like too chaotic. Yeah. You know, that's why they train right. outside to make better decisions. And kind of have the muscle memory and stuff when it comes down because if all if you only practice when it's like the heat of battle yeah. you, you make way more mistakes and Absolutely. it's just really hard to to get into the i'm a huge fan of practice yeah of all kinds of skills yes awesome well we're gonna wrap up you got a one-liner you want to tell everybody before we go yeah check out peer-to-peer -peer. check out belindadi.com and um you know if anybody needs any resources there's lots of free stuff on there so i encourage you to be committed to your businesses. Um, do the things that it takes. Don't, you know, worry yeah. about failing and just go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Uh, and I'm going to end just with the message of gratitude because it is Thanksgiving. Thank you for Thank coming you on for again. Thank you for having me. And just being awesome and around. And for all of you who have uh, been supportive of this uh, over, it's been like a year and a half. And it's amazing to me that we're still sitting here doing this. Because yes. this was a, this was just thrown up I was just like oh let's see what happens here yeah. and it's it's been really awesome and the community surrounding it has just been so supportive and positive and uh yeah I'm I'm really appreciative so thank you all uh and and yeah keep it up like she said go for it I'm gonna go for it and we'll go 
for it next week on Friday. We'll be back to, to Zoom and uh, you'll have some music and commercial breaks. This is harder without commercials. Oh, yeah. I like when we did it last time, I was like, I was just so pumped to do it. I didn't yeah. care. And I've been spoiled to do like the 15 <laughs> minute segments and, and then, then like, you get a break. a break and then like I can think about like what's next and then I'm like, Bruh. Uh, anyways, uh, I always like a good challenge. So awesome. Everybody have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Woo. Bye.